Hi everyone, Josh here with Northern Frogger, and today I want to do my first PC Spotlight video. Uh, this is going to be a series where I go around and uh, eventually cover all the species or morphs that I have in the frog room. Um, today I'm going to start with the uh, Dendrobates leucomalus, often known as the bumblebee dart frog or the yellow banded poison frog. Uh, but if you've done any research into dart frogs at all, I'm sure you've heard of these guys or seen them. Uh, one of the most common. Uh, they were one of the first ones to be imported back when people started keeping dart frogs uh, in captivity. Um, so they've been in the hobby since uh, early to mid 90s. Um, they were one of the very first ones imported into the US. And they've kind of been a mainstay of the hobby ever since. And I thought I'd start with them because they were they were my second ever dart frog, but they were the first ones I ever successfully bred um, and got froglets from. And being one of the most common and often considered as one of the best beginner dart frogs, um, I thought it'd be a good place to uh, to kick off this series. Uh, so yeah, as uh, as I said before, this is one of the most common frogs in the hobby. Um, so it does have a ton of different common names. Um, I usually just call them Lukes. Uh, short for the Leucomalus. And uh, kind of an interesting fact about that name, um, it actually means white and black in Latin. And it was named that way because the first person to describe them was actually dealing with uh, specimens that have been preserved and shipped back to Europe from South America. And uh, the preservative they used uh, when they were shipping them actually bleached all the yellow color out. So uh, the first person to describe them was actually looking at a, a a white and black frog. I uh, didn't realize that the, the color had just been bleached out. So yeah, there's good reason these guys are one of the most common in the hobby, and it's not just because they've been one of the ones that's that's been around the longest. They are relatively bold frogs, um, fairly active. You're gonna see them in the vivarium quite a bit. Uh, they've got a nice, pretty pleasant call. Uh, they do really well in groups, and uh, they just have some really nice colors to them. That high contrast black and yellow uh, really appeals to a lot of people, uh, including me. Uh, and of course, uh, they're relatively easy to breed. Uh, they do have a bit of a reputation as a seasonal breeder. I haven't found mine to be seasonal breeders at all. They'll breed pretty much all year round. I have heard some of them, especially certain localities, uh, are more seasonal breeders. So I will go over a bit more about that uh, later on in the video. So basic care for these guys is going to be pretty similar to pretty much all the dart frogs. You know, want high humidity. Uh, 70, 70 to 100 percent relative humidity and uh, as far as temperatures are pretty okay at room temperatures low 20 celsius or uh, like low 70s fahrenheit somewhere in that range um, in terms of diet just like most of the frogs are going to eat uh, mainly the flightless fruit flies drosophila melanogaster or drosophila hydei uh, they will readily take both if you're getting uh, juveniles, buying frogs that are about three to four months old most of the time, uh, usually you're probably going to want to start those ones on the Melanogaster and then transition them to Heidi Eye as they get a bit older. And Lukes of any age will also eat uh, springtails and isopods, so you're going to want to have those guys in your vivarium uh, as part of your, your microfauna cleanup crew. And they don't require any additional heat, I already said, just room temperature. They don't require UV bulbs or anything special like that. You do want some kind of a daylight spectrum bulb just to be able to grow the plants. And these guys really are best kept in some kind of uh, planted, bioactive, naturalistic vivarium like these ones I have here. And uh, these are actually pretty long-lived frogs. Dart frogs can live up to 20 years in captivity if cared for properly. More likely, it's probably going to be 10 to 15 years. It seems to be more common, but... Uh, this pair, my original pair of Lukes right here, um, are about 15 to 16 years old now and uh, still look really healthy, still lay eggs pretty much every week. In terms of size, I would consider these kind of a medium sized dart frog. Adults are probably going to be about 4 centimeters or so. I'm maxing out at maybe 5 centimeters, uh, which is somewhere like an inch and a half to 2 inches, somewhere like that I think. Um, and same with most dart frogs where the males are a little bit smaller. Uh, females are a little bit bigger, a little bit more robust, heavier built. Um, so just to touch on the enclosures a little bit more, I would consider a 10 gallon to be about the bare minimum for a pair of Leucomalus. Um, I do have one pair in a 10 gallon right now, but I do feel it's a little bit small for them. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be upgrading them fairly soon. Um, but they do do pretty well in groups. Um, in this uh, vivarium, I've just got one pair. Um, but then in another one, the same size is an 18 by 18 by 24. I've got another group of five uh, with two females and three males. And they all seem to get along pretty good too. I do catch the females wrestling a little bit every once in a while, but um, it never seems to last very long. And 
doesn't seem to be nearly as aggressive as some of the uh, wrestling matches I've seen between the Tinctorious. And just to reiterate, you do definitely want some kind of uh, planted bioactive vivarium. Uh, the plants kind of give the frog somewhere to hide, somewhere to climb on, and uh, it's really going to help increase and uh, stabilize that humidity in the enclosure as well. And even though it's a bit more work to set up initially, um, it is going to be really low maintenance long term. And some of these I've had running for years without really having to do anything. And having that microfauna in the soil just kind of completes that ecosystem um, where they're going to help break down the frog waste and any like dead leaves, stuff like that. And that's basically going to turn into fertilizer, which is in turn going to help the plants grow. And these guys are usually the ones I recommend um, as the best beginner dart frog. Um, I think they're actually a pretty good beginner frog in general. And that's for a couple reasons. Uh, one is just uh, one of the things I really like about dart frogs, and you've, I'm sure you've heard me say this in other videos, and I'm sure I'm going to say it in the future again, but uh, just the fact that they're one of the few frogs that are diurnal, meaning they're active during the day, so you are going to see them a lot more. They are just relatively active, uh, like compared to something like a Pac-Man frog that's pretty much just going to sit there and be a lump 95% of the time. Um, Dart frogs are constantly moving around, hopping around the terrarium looking for flies or a little microfauna and stuff like that. So yeah, highly visible in your vivarium, which I think uh, is something that um, a beginner really appreciates. And they're fairly bold, like some of the dart frogs can be a little bit shy. Um, or even they're going to be fairly active if you're not around, but as soon as you walk by their terrarium they might go running for cover and hide for a bit. So you might not see some of them, I find a lot of the erratus are like that, and they're a little bit little bit more timid and uh, you have to be a little bit more patient to see them kind of come out in a boat. Whereas the Lukes are not quite as bold as the Tinctorius but they're kind of in the middle between Neurotis and Tinctorius I find most of the time. And they're relatively low maintenance um, just in general with all the dart frogs just the fact that they don't need any additional heat, they don't need special expensive UV UVB bulbs. The initial cost and effort of setting up one of these vivariums uh, is going to be a little more involved than maybe some habitats for some other frogs but once you get it established like it really is pretty easy to take care of I find. And one of the things about the Leucomalus in particular that I think are good for beginners is that they are um, a little bit more forgiving of some low humidity or temperature swings that are probably more common uh, with a beginner. In the wild these guys are kind of from northern South America, uh, they're going to be found in like Guyana, uh, a little bit in Colombia, kind of the very northern uh, tip of Brazil, and over most of Venezuela. And most of the dart frogs come from rainforest environments, and uh, the Lukes are really no exception to that, but they are found at a little bit lower elevations a lot of times, and in areas that do experience a bit more of a dry season, their seasonal fluctuations, uh, where most of the dart frog habitats are pretty stable year-round. Um, and some of the places where the lukes are found are a little bit more scrubland, grassland areas where they're going to be a little bit drier and a little bit hotter um, at certain times of the year. And uh, the leucomalus are actually the only dart frogs that are known to estivate in the wild. So they are a little bit more tolerant of humidity swings, which I think uh, makes them good for a beginner. They're going to be a little bit more hardy, a little bit less sensitive than some of the smaller frogs. I think the Tinctorius are fairly hardy. I don't like to rec recommend them for beginners as much just because beginners tend to want a group of frogs and I find the Tinctorius are usually best kept in just pairs because uh, they can be a little bit more territorial. And they are relatively easy to breed uh, which I think makes them really appealing because it's uh, some really interesting behavior uh, that you can watch in the vivarium. is like the male calls the female and kind of goes through their whole courtship routine and then uh, being able to see the eggs and uh, raise up the tadpoles, which are relatively easy too. Um, just being able to see that whole amphibian life cycle, I think, is uh, pretty inter interesting to a lot of people. And I think these guys are a, a really good one to start with that if you're interested in getting into dart frog breeding. I did mention before that they're a little bit seasonal sometimes, and in the wild they do come from a little bit more seasonal habitats. Uh, so if you do have a pair that you're pretty sure is a pair but they're not breeding, um, there is a trick you can do uh, where you kind of put them through a simulated dry season. Um, basically this is just you kind of reduce the misting frequency for a few weeks, maybe a couple months. Um, not let them really dry out, but just 
And maybe if you're mis misting twice a day, you might cut it down to once a day or every other day, something like that. And then after a little while, you just start misting them like crazy. Make sure they're really well fed for like a few days prior. And a lot of times that will stimulate them to breed. Um, and it can be helpful too, I've heard, to, to try and time that heavy misting cycle with uh, like natural precipitation events in your area. So to kind of keep an eye on your local forecast because there is there is some evidence that they can kind of sense the barometric pressure, um, which kind of allows them to predict weather patterns and time their breeding with that. Um, so if you time your heavy mist misting period with a time where you're normally, where you're actually getting a lot of rainfall outside, um, that can kind of help stimulate them to get breeding too. So one other thing to mention is that there are um, a few different morphs or localities of these guys. Um, the ones that I have kind of were one of the early ones that came in so there's not really any location data um, at least for these ones and these ones that i have um, i also have a pair of the guyana yellows which are more recent import um, were brought in from guyana obviously um, in the last few years and there's some other ones like the blue footed um, which i'm not sure it seems unclear whether that's actually a wild morph or if that's just a uh, something that's been kind of lime, lime bred in captivity. I'm not really sure. Um, I've kind of heard contradictory information on that. Um, so if anybody knows any more about that, maybe let me know down in the down in the comments there. Uh, there's also the fine spot variety, um, which I think are really cool. I'd like to get some of those. Um, but in terms of their care, they're all going to be pretty much exactly the same. Uh, so yeah, I do think these guys are great beginner frogs. Um, one of the best beginner dart frogs and one of the best beginner frogs uh, there are. can be a little bit intimidating uh, just because of the how involved it is to set up one of these variums for the first time and the requirement for the very small food items that you're going to have to probably culture your own fruit flies. But if you're the type of person who's willing to do your research, uh, figure out what you need to do and put the time in to build a proper enclosure and uh, you're organized enough to kind of keep on top of that schedule of, of uh, maintaining your fly cultures, um, I think these these leucomelis are a great frog for uh, any beginner frog keeper. But I'm definitely interested to know what you guys think about that. Agree or disagree? Let me know down in the comments there. And as always, any other questions, comments, suggestions, throw them down below there. And let me know which frog you'd like to see in the next uh, species spotlight video. So I hope you enjoyed that video. And until next time, happy frogging.